The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, the only podcast which is devoted to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, SignalR, and not forgetting the .NET Core community itself. I am your host, Jamie Kaprogman-Taylor, and this is episode 38, Rider with Kirill Skargan. In this episode, I interviewed Kirill about Rider and ReSharper from JetBrains. Some of you may know Kirill from his work on both the ReSharper and Rider projects, and some of his work on the JetBrains open source projects. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .net new podcast, and let the show begin. So thank you very much for joining me on the show, uh, Kirill. I know that uh, it's incredibly uh, well. It's not. It's not the easiest thing in the world to organise a meeting between two people who are in completely different time zones. So uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for this opportunity to be here. For the people who are listening in who may not know directly about you or who you are, could you give us a quick introduction into like who you are, the work you do, that kind of thing? Yes, my name is Kira. I work at JetBrain since 2010. I started to work uh, um, in ReSharper team. I became uh, one of the principal engineers in ReSharper. And then I think in 2014 or maybe in 2015, I, I started forgetting all these dates. We started a new prototype, a new idea to build our own IDE. And in a couple of years, it turned out that this prototype um, works out pretty well. So and we gathered a team and I became a team lead of Rider. Since then, I'm leading the Rider as a project, as a product, as a team lead. I'm just passionate about Rider. <laughs> That's it, I think. Okay, fantastic. Could you give us a bit of an introduction to Rider itself and maybe how it differs from Visual Studio? And maybe, I mean, there's a lot of questions here, but like, you know, what's Rider? Why is it different to Visual Studio? And is it related in any way to any of the other IDs that JetBrains sort of manufactures? Yeah, sure. So um, back to 2015, I guess, uh, it was in November when Microsoft announced that .NET Core are going to be open sourced and all this stuff. And this was the the point when we decided, okay, let's do it. Let's just start building our own IDE. Let's at least try. I don't think there was like a good business or product perspective. We analyzed the market very deeply and uh, like we said, okay, let's do it. Instead of this, apart from this here at JetBrains, we have the opportunity to build our own even products, uh, not just be- because we need it for the market, not just because we will uh, generate some money in a couple of years and return back the investments, but because we just want to do this. And this makes feel us pumped up, you know. And uh, Rider was one of this project. Well, the technical reason for this was that, that just ReSharper with Visual Studio had a quite hard times in terms of performance for huge projects. Now, ReSharper solution contains more than 300 projects in the solution, and uh, the overall .NET suite contains 600 projects. So you can imagine it's just a huge, huge solution. And uh, we just couldn't open it in Visual Studio and ReSharper anymore. And sometimes we just couldn't open it in in a modern Visual Studio anymore. And we thought how if we will make our own ID that will be capable to open this. And yeah, we were thinking how would we do this? Um, I mean, building the new ID. And it should be cross-platform one side because all of our IntelliJ based ideas cross platform the other side if we we'll, if we would build a new IntelliJ based id from scratch we would reimplement all this all these resharper features from scratch which would take i don't know 10 20 years and we thought uh, what if we will bind together resharper and IntelliJ but bind um, via our, our own protocol that will connect not the the complex structures like syntax trees, indices, and, and so 
etc. Uh, instead, it will bind the the view models. So if we will, for example, bind the view model of Alt Enter in ReSharper and represent ReSharper's Alt Enter model in IntelliJ as a view as a render, we don't need to re-implement all these features. They will be performed there in the backend and the ReSharper site. And we started doing this, and amazingly, but <laughs> it worked. It worked. Although, although sometimes I, I look at Rider, and for example, when when I call a feature, sometimes I'm just amazed how much stuff is done behind the scenes. It's just incredible, and this works well. <laughs> Now, uh, in terms of the difference with Visual Studio and why does it matter to an end users? Well, first thing is that this approach first allows us to have a cross-platform ID because the backend is cross-platform, ReSharper. This backend is now 64 bits, not 32 bits as Visual Studio. Uh, IntelliJ as a front-end is also cross-platform and the protocol is cross-platform. So we can do this on Linux and on Mac. Uh, second thing is that while being a ReSharper developer, I struggled a lot with performance issues in ReSharper and ID in general. And the main performance issue in ID, I think this applies to most kind of applications, basically, is the responsiveness of UI thread. Just change it to dispatch thread if you're thinking about the server and uh, your ASP.NET server, and you'll get the same. And it can be affected by different ways, but one of those is garbage collection, because garbage collection suspends all the threads. Now, when we have the backend separated from frontend in a separate process, the garbage collection occurs there, and it doesn't affect the, the smoothness of an editor. It doesn't affect the frontend. So, uh, point num number two is that this architecture with separated backend and frontend guarantees that garbage collection will not affect the, the editor. And the third thing is that while being fast and responsive, at least designed to be fast and responsive, we gain all these two sharper features already in one point of release, already in, it was 2017.1 release, yes. So all these three points, the combination of all those three being cross-platform, being fast, but still being feature-rich, gives the result from my point of view because when you when you look at visual studio like it it is one would say it is quite feature rich id for sure and it's solid but it's not very fast when it comes to huge projects uh, both in terms of footprint and in terms of latency in terms of responsiveness of an editor i'm talking about vanilla visual studio without a shopper and when you talk about VS Code, of course, we know that it's, it is very, very fast, but there are lots of users that complain that it's not feature-rich enough. It's just an editor, not an IDE. So Rider, I think, is a, is a combination for all of these. Yeah, I think this is, this is the case. This is why I think Rider really differs from both, from Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, and why it grows so fast. Okay, that's there's a lot to unpack there, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't wish for you to give away the secret sauce, I guess. But is is Rider, is it IntelliJ or is it a separate sort of product? Well, the, I I told about the backend, which is based on a ReSharper. The Rider's backend, like imagine the ReSharper taken out of Visual Studio and made as a separate process, as a separate feature server, I would say. Which runs locally, yes, but it's like a server. And the front end is based on IntelliJ, yes. So the UI and UX will be the same as an IntelliJ platform. But the main difference with other IntelliJ product, products is that it is a light IntelliJ based ID. We try to get rid of all the indices, all the syntax parsing, AST, and other heavy stuff to get rid of it and to move it to a backend. So it's like a light, lightened version of IntelliJ-based ID. 
By the way, this this gives us another interesting um, advantage is that the, all the plugins which do not work and do not deal with uh, syntax trees, all these plugins will be applicable for Rider as well uh, if they are pre- applicable for IntelliJ IDE. Wow, okay. So there's um, a large amount of uh, extensibility, I guess, sort of built into it because it has this common background with IntelliJ. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the Nyan Cat progress indicator is there. <laughs> it's quite important. You know, some, some people come to our booth and they ask about Rider and they are not aware about Rider. And I say like, hey, like all the syntax trees, performance, garbage collection, this feature, that feature. And all of a sudden they ask, okay, okay, that's fine. But do you have a dark theme? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to say I'm a big fan of the dark theme and... Um... Yeah, it makes it a lot easier on my eyes. Some people are different, you know. I can understand that. All of the work that you and your team have put into making this uh, the software, and the first question they ask is, well, does it have a dark theme? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have to admit, this is quite important, and we really make a lot of efforts, not about the deeply technical stuff like performance or some huge refactoring, something internal, but about the UX and UI as well. This is super important, of course, for users. We do the UX researches on the conferences privately. We see how people are using, trying to use Rider. Most of these, of course, have a huge Visual Studio background. And we try to adapt. It's kind of tricky because on one hand, we try to satisfy these users and attract these users. And on the other hand, we are still share the common platform with IntelliJ. So it's kind of balancing between these two. And on the third point, we have to be ourselves. We have to invent our own rider stuff. Yeah, but I think it works out pretty well. Well, I guess it must work out pretty well because, you know, a lot of people use it. Yeah. Just uh, hanging on to that for a moment about um, IntelliJ uh, being a common, parts of IntelliJ being common, and that it's a cross-platform ID. Were there any specific challenges with creating a .NET-focused cross-platform ID and having the big, maybe we have to be better than Visual Studio? Was that a thing that, that was a design idea, or was it just a case of there are other IDEs, but we're going to focus on this? And like I say, how did you go about the, it's going to be cross-platform, it needs to look good on all OSs, or was that something that the IntelliJ background part of it took care of? Well, yes, we actually look at Visual Studio on Windows, Visual Studio for Mac. At those times, it was called Xamarin Studio, mono-develop on Mac and Linux. And yes, we had a desire to be better on all of these platforms, and still we have this desire. In terms of technical t- challenges, um, this backend, this resharper runs in mono right now. So if you launch Rider on your Mac, uh, the Rider's backend, all these resharper features, all these feature ser- server I described previously is running on mono. Uh, we had quite a lot of challenges to make it run on mono because mono, of course, differs from classy.net runtime. We mocked some stuff. We found quite a lot of deadlocks, multi-threading bugs. But I have to I have to say that all of these issues were resolved with Mono Team, and we made some PRs. We've launched some bugs. Mostly, all of them were resolved. Um, by the way, quite quickly. And uh, But um, we still have some problems with Mono in terms of performance because Mono tends to consume a lot of, lot of memory, um, a lot of RAM, I mean the footprint memory. And sometimes it just slow, extremely slow sometimes regarding the I.O. operations. So our next goal is to port our backend from Mono to .NET Core. And I'm happy to announce that just two weeks ago, 
we have firstly launched the prototype of Rider's backend on Linux running on .NET Core. So it's quite an amazing result. So looking, really looking forward to deliver this maybe by the next, by the end of this year, maybe in the beginning of the next year. And yeah, what else? What else? What else? In terms of the competition. Well, yeah, in the very beginning, the uh, competition between us and Visual Studio really drove us, made us work, work, and work. We still compete with Visual Studio, of course, and we feel that Visual Studio competes with us. (laughs) When Ryder firstly came on the market and Microsoft realizes they have a new competitor, they started to be, well... Sometimes we're just laughing when we see the release notes of Visual Studio because it looks like they just go through the roadmap of uh, ReSharper five or seven years ago and just trying to re-implement all this in Visual Studio. <laughs> it's definitely, by the way, stepping in our toes in terms of business because there is a, an idea that some people, they don't, do not require ReSharper anymore and they will just use vanilla Visual Studio since it will have all these features. Well, uh, if it is so, it is a threat to us, and Rider is the right answer, as well as uh, making ReSharper much, much faster. I guess the thing to take away from that part is, uh, obviously, there are multiple IDEs, and you know people should choose that, because it's a tool at the end of the day, it's, it's choose the tool that fits best with your development practice. Yeah, um, you mean different .NET related technologies, which are uh, relevant to Rider? Uh, sorry, no, I mean, when you brought up that, uh, you know, Visual Studio is, is implementing some of the ReSharper features, I guess. Uh, I think having competition in a marketplace is a good thing because it forces innovation. Mm-hmm. So depending on how you define innovation, innovation may be looking at what your competitors are doing and doing the same thing, or it may be looking at what your competitors are doing and trying to outperform them in some way. And I think that perhaps Buzz Visual Studio was the uh, the the only ID for .NET developers for the longest time. And like you say, because it's so feature rich, you know, we're, I don't want to detract from the fact that Visual Studio has lots of things that it does. You know, it's got the WinForms designer built in, WCF designer built in, UWP designer built in. With a few tweaks to the installer, you've got the Xamarin designer built in. You've got all of these things, all of these tools, millions of tools that, you know, the majority of developers may use or may not, you know? And I think having that competition in yourselves kind of must help the Visual Studio team to, I don't want to say produce a better product, but produce a more innovative than the previous version. Yes, I totally agree. And I think who really wins here is a .NET ecosystem in general because they, what we have is a wonderful tooling you can choose. If you are, for example, IntelliJ, uh, you have an IntelliJ-based experience. For example, some people, they, they are coming from, let's say, PyCharm. You can use Rider. This is a familiar ID for you. If you are really stick to Visual Studio, you have Visual Studio, and it, it's, it's really became much better idea, a much better place to write your code recently. And I just totally agree, yeah. And now uh, when, when I'm comparing the .NET ecosystem, the new .NET core ecosystem with uh, other, like, for example, Java one, I think that the .NET ecosystem is growing much more rapidly in different aspects. And tooling is one of those very, very important aspects. So yeah, I think that this this strategic move made by Microsoft to make it open source actually was a good turn because we started to make Rider, we forced Visual Studio, we just you know like kick their ass, and they started to be better as well. And all all these movements, all these actions, um, by the end of the day, they just make .NET much better place to build your application, to build the full stack business solutions. Sure. And um, I mean, like you said earlier on, you know, Rider is is cross-platform, right? Mm -hmm. Visual Studio, there are tools with the Visual Studio branding that are cross-platform-ish. So we have, like you said, Visual Studio code is 
good if you want an editor, not a full IDE. Visual Studio for Mac is good if you want to do Visual Studio things, but on Mac OS, but there's not been the one tool, I guess, that can be used across all three that have been released by Microsoft, which is, I guess, where you, you guys have the corner on the market. You have this pretty tried and tested IDE sort of framework that you can fall back on and say, yeah, we'll do loads of work to make it work with .NET, but you know, now it works with .NET. And of course, we've said a lot that, you know, Rider uses .NET Core, but obviously, I think if you're on Windows, you can build your .NET apps as well, so .NET Classic, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Both classy .NET applications are supported .NET Core and Mono application on Mac and on Linux. So we basically support all kind of .NET applications right now. Unity, Xamarin, WinForms, WPF, Mono, .NET Core, ASP.NET. Wow, okay. That's a long list of technologies that you support. Yeah, the C++ support is is coming also by the end of this year. I think it will will open the, the private beta by the end of this year. Some people say maybe writers should focus on something... Something, you know, more specific, like .NET Core ID, and that's it. And be the best of the best of the best only here. I think we can do both. And I think that it's just kind of silly to close this market opportunities. Because all these market parts, for example, WPF users or Xamarin users, even though Xamarin is stagnating or maybe even descending, all these markets are huge. Like There are lots of enterprise, lots of developers which are writing Xamarin. To me, it would be just silly not to invest a little and open this opportunity and to support Xamarin, for example, Xamarin applications. That's why we've built our own Windows Forms designer. In 2019, we released Windows Forms Designer in Rider. I mean, why not? Windows Forms is now a supported technology on .NET Core when running on Windows, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, Microsoft released said that, hey, .NET Core 3 will support both WPF and, and, uh, and Windows Forms. Well, I mean, you guys over at JetBrains are part of the .NET Foundation, right? So it's not like, I mean, there is an element of competition, but... You know, you guys are helping to push .NET, you know, into the future, I guess. I really hope so. <laughs> and I, I believe so, yeah. I got this question from a friend of mine. So one of the things that I feel like it would be remiss of me not to ask. We are recording this on the third day of .NET Conf, so the final day of .NET Conf. And it was only a few days ago that uh, Microsoft sort of officially released .NET Core 3.0, you know, that wasn't a release candidate or a public preview beta or anything. I'm just wondering how quickly you guys can add the support for the new versions of things. So uh, .NET Core 3.0 came out a few days ago. C Sharp 8 came out a few days ago. Like, is there a huge amount of effort that goes into adding support for these into Rider slash ReSharper? Or is it a case of, well, we've known about these things for a year, so we just need to flick a switch and rebuild, I guess? Yeah, we kind of known about this because there are a bunch of previews for all of this, for C Sharp and for .NET Core. And we constantly support all the previews. And when it comes to the RTM version, we briefly check that like the APIs are not broken and still the product functions properly. And if not, we are fixing a couple of issues. For example, Something was broken between the last preview and 3.0 RTM of .NET Core, and we are fixing this right now. And uh, in a week, I think, we'll release Rider 19.2.3 that will officially support both .NET Core 3 and C Sharp 8. Yes, we definitely monitor all these updates previews, betas, alphas, and we're starting to support these technologies as early as we can. Sometimes it is a trade-off because if we'll support the alpha version of new Nugget packages, for example, and we'll invest a lot and then in a month they'll rewrite everything. (laughs) Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. But even before Rider in the ReSharper team, 
it was the same because we had to support lots of technologies which are coming along with Microsoft stack, development stack. So we, we got to get used to it and just find all the processes in uh, here at JetBrains and .NET department is very well tuned to support this. So like looking at ReSharper for a moment rather than just on Rider, because obviously you came from the, the ReSharper team as well. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that like, do you need to know the C Sharp spec back to front? How do you go from, oh, there's this new feature been released for C Sharp 8, for instance, and we need to sort of add that into ReSharper. Is that a huge process or is it a couple of developers sit around and go, yep, this is how we do it and this is how we can allow it. Like, Because I can't even imagine how complex ReSharper has to be to be able to support all of the possible things that, that we can do in C Sharp and .NET and F Sharp and all those kind of things. And then being able to analyze the code figure out a slightly better way of doing something and then presenting that to the user. Like, how does all of that work? I mean, without going into the nitty gritty to give away the magic secret sauce. Well, first of all, we have a dedicated language support team in ReSharper. Very, very talented uh, people there and um, very well educated, <laughs> very smart. They, as far as I know, when I was in ReSharper and I was a full-time ReSharper developer, they work with specs, with C-Sharp specs, which also come along with a new preview version. Sometimes the specs are not very up to date i would say and they have to improvise <laughs> but um yeah sometimes sometimes they have to just think from themselves how it probably will be working in the future and build the the architecture to language support correspondingly I would suggest to follow on Twitter ContraFlow, our team lead of language support. He has a wonderful tweets and jokes about some corner cases in the language support. You have no idea how trashy and funky and interesting stuff you can write with the new features of C Sharp, and still this should be supported by us. So it is hard, but we have a dedicated team to support this, and therefore it, it works. So I guess um, that particular team would have been working hard over the last couple of last six months or so as new things are discussed uh, out in the open now, I guess, because C Sharp 8 is now partially, I guess, designed out in the open. So I guess the team there would have been perhaps part of those decisions or perhaps just sort of a silent person sitting back and going, ah, yeah, right, okay, so how do we implement this? Sometimes, yes. I I heard some cases when we complained about some of the decisions that it's it's going to be very, they're not obvious or they're controversial or something. But mostly it is in the read-only mode. We see all these conversations. I, I, I would not say for the language team, to be honest, but I've heard some, some examples that, yes, there is some kind of collaboration. Is there potentially a feature that, now obviously I'm not going to hold you to this, whatever you say about this, but is there a feature that is not currently present in Rider that you would love to implement if you were given an infinite amount of time to implement it? Very good question. Well, the most exciting, interesting, and promising features are already being implemented by the team. They're not announced. They're not in the public. One of those is, for example, like live share support. Like both Visual Studio and VS Code, they have a live share feature when you can collaboratively work with each other. We're doing the same, but I believe in much more pleasant way. So uh, one, the guest that connects to someone's computer will have not just very, very stupid uh, auto-completion, but rich, resharper-like completion, highlightings, of course, the solution explorer, find usages, all the navigations, alt enter, everything. And we are working on this, and I think this would be a very exciting feature. Uh, what will come the next is that Visual Studio Code already already shown this, is some sort of, of a cloud IDE where when the backend is hosted there uh, remotely on the cloud, on the cloud remote node, and you just connect there with the thin client. So I also think this is a future. And right now, 
Ryder uh, I said previously that we have IntelliJ as an affronted but it's a, like a light version of IntelliJ unfortunately it's not super light <laughs> it's not super thin client and there are some things like webstorm webstorm is very relevant to .net so all this web related functionality is on the front end right now and this is the reason sometimes of some performance issues so I believe when we'll do completely thin client will be that will be still very feature rich. Like today's rider, this will make rider even more much more fast, but still very feature rich. I also dream that one day coming to my job, I will not just open the IE and for example when I update to master the fresh master branch. Why the heck should I update all these indices and rebuild all this stuff and launch my internal tool once again? Because there are a bunch of people in my team or maybe in JetBrains which already did this. So maybe this could be done previously a day ago on a CI. Then the only thing that I could do is just to take the already built caches and indices from the server, from the remote and voila it will work instantly so i think this is not a very interesting direction to move but all of these directions are in our site and we are working on it we talked earlier on about uh, some of the features from resharper were sort of you know added to visual studio and i like that you guys have kind of gone the other way and gone, hey, this live share feature thing looks really cool. Can we implement that? And you're looking to implement that too. And the, that idea of perhaps having the thin client talking to a remote uh, server as well, I, I like that too. Yeah, and it doesn't solve only the performance problem here. Sometimes it is very hard to mock all these services, remote services locally. For example, I have I'm debugging the application that it hosted on the clouds, and they have lots of services there, and it would be very hard to mock and to like replicate all the services locally to uh, set up the same environment to debug to fix. So instead of doing this work, why couldn't we just be there, be on the remote, and code there, and fix it there, and debug it there? without all these um, stupid mocks and replications. I think this is also one of the reasons both VS Code is talking more and more about the, the remote debugging and this remote coding and live share. And we are definitely also thinking about this. I like that. It's, it's like we said earlier on, you know, having competition in the market helps to forge innovation because well, let's say Visual Studio stays the way it is and you guys stay the way you guys are, then you're going to get to a point where nobody has new features because nobody wants to implement new features. But I think having that healthy competition helps because then you can compare notes with, oh, this is how the Visual Studio team have done it. Well, how about we go and do that? Or indeed, if a third party comes in and says, we're going to make our own ID and it's going to be better than everyone's because, well, because, you know, being able to innovate, you know, it's the, it's the reason why we have multiple manufacturers of cars, multiple manufacturers of TVs, you know. Yeah, I totally agree. And if you take a look at uh, Unity support in Rider uh, for the last two or three years, it improved so dramatically. Right now, we have a dedicated Unity team in Rider to support Unity-related features. And we introduced just amazing stuff. For example, Rider is now is just... I, I don't want to, to market, <laughs> to boldly market Rider here, but just to emphasize the most exciting and technologically exciting stuff. Just imagine that Rider is connected with Unity Editor via the protocol. So this, and we build features on top of this connection. So for example, Unity Editor, was an, which is an editor for game development and Rider. And Unity developers, they have to switch from Unity Editor to Rider or to Visual Studio and there and back, there and back, which is a productivity loss. So what we can do is we can show some Unity-related information right in Rider because we have this protocol connection. So this is a good example of a new feature which is invented by us, by vendor, JetBrains, just to be better than Visual Studio, to attract more users. But 
in general, the Unity users, the Unity developers, they win. They got the perfect tooling. They got the amazing ideas. And then the Visual Studio looks at, hey, Rider guys, they introduce a new code completion that generate the event functions for you. Let's do the same. They're trying also to improve. So yeah, it's definitely great, great, great thing. Changing slightly again, with the new stuff that's coming out in Donnie Core 3 and C Sharp 8, as a person, not as a representative of JetBrains or the Rider team, mm -hmm. what would be something that you'd like to see in the next version of either .NET or C Sharp or F Sharp or any of those tools and languages? What's the one thing that you're looking forward to if, the, if you had an unlimited budget of you know, people to work on it and implement it, what would be the one thing that you would look for in the next version of .NET Core or C Sharp or any of those tools? Wow, great question. Actually, I'm so excited about the upcoming roadmap by Microsoft that I don't have any of my own ideas. Like the .NET 5, which will be the synergetic merge of Mono and .NET Core runtime, is just amazing and <laughs> i'm very pumped about this well what can i say regarding the managed run times i always thinking about the uh, head of time compilation and if this will be sorted just smoothly out of the box by dotnet core i know about cross -gen. And I'm seeing the both Java and .NET struggling with this for years. Like there are a bunch of issues with NGAN. There are a bunch of issues with uh, how it's called, just ahead of time compilation, Graal or something. Yeah. Now in JDK, Java's JDK 13, they have the bundled AOT. But still, it looks like it's kind of a raw technology, and you have to tune it. You have to do something to set something up in my view this is very important how fast is your application starting up so i don't know it seems to me that it should be just supported out of the box there were some efforts regarding the before the cross gen how was it called like the native compilation right yeah and the start of, of an application but as far as i know people in production they do not use it a lot. Maybe I'm wrong. Please correct me. So I wish that this stuff would be much, much more trendy. It would be just normal to have this. I suppose, though, if the vendors made ahead of time native compilation the default, then no one would use the just-in-time stuff, which means that all of the effort that's gone into, I guess, implementing the just-in-time stuff would then, uh, I don't think, would be wasted, but... Uh, it wouldn't get used, I guess. So I wonder whether that's part of the reason why. But I guess, like you say, I think bringing in the mono tool set and the mono runtime parts of that, especially things like the mono linker, will mean that we'll be able to get better tree shaking and a lot of ahead of time native compilation, which is important for things like Blazor. You don't want to be shipping a 50 megabyte DLL to the user just because you've included JSON.net and you're only using deserialize of type T. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So again, without wanting to set any expectations for users, what does the public future for Rider and ReSharper look like? Uh, are there a lot of extremely exciting features? I know we kind of touched on a few earlier on where you said, hopefully in the next release, we're going to do this and do that. I was just wondering, are there any that you are allowed to talk about that are definitely coming up in maybe the next six months, 12 months of Rider? Like what's on the roadmap, I guess? Okay, I can talk about the tactic, the local roadmap and the strategic one. In terms of first one, uh, in 19.3, we almost finishing to implement these technological gaps between us and Visual Studio. For example, by saying this, I mean like Rider has much better, let's say, code completion, navigation, and refactoring. But if it doesn't support T4 templates, then like lots of teams just cannot use it. 
in production. For the last two years, we've implemented lots of such things, like uh, resource generations, Windows Forms, project properties, just lots of stuff. And D4 is one of the last things we have to implement. And in 19.3, we'll release D4 support. Wonderful with language support with Generator. Yeah, I'll happy to announce that. Now, apart from this... Well, basically, there are lots of stuff. Just if I'll enumerate all this stuff, it will last for five or ten minutes. <laughs> but currently, we are working. Maybe this will be more interesting to our listeners that, and this is more relevant to strategic plans. We're working on porting our back into .NET Core, so Rider will be faster on Mac and Linux, and maybe on Windows as well, because .NET Core is half a year ahead of the classy .NET framework. Now, another thing is that we are working on live share functionality in the Rider. I think it will be released next year. By the end of this year, for Unity users, we'll announce, hopefully, coverage support for Unity and we'll be the first to support test coverage for Unity developers, both test coverage and continuous testing. Regarding the profilers, we're going to support .NET Core profilers everywhere on Linux, on Mac, in Rider, on Windows, of course. So you can finally profile .NET Core application on Linux with the dot .trace embedded into Rider. We are also working a lot about the UX and UI. As, as I said uh, before, some people with a huge Visual Studio background, they feel themselves not very comfy when they start using Rider. They cannot find the VCS tool window, the version control. I mean, they cannot find various search and they cannot find, they can't understand trunk configuration concept from IntelliJ. And this is fine. We have no right to blame these people, yeah, because I always like to say to my developers that users are always right. So if user said it's wrong, you have to listen to it. You have to adapt. You have to adjust. You have to take it into account, not say you don't understand our concept. I think this is totally wrong. And then step after step, we evolve and we introduce a new UX, UI concept, which try to solve this problem. So yeah, in 19.3, we will try to solve some of these UX problems, discoverability problems, for example, visibility problems, some of our features some controversial actions, some maybe too overcomplicated buttons, UI elements. So we'll, we'll try to address this as well. Um, uh, in terms of ReSharper, uh, we're working on making ReSharper just dramatically faster by moving it out of Visual Studio the same way we've done for Rider. So just imagine the same ReSharp as a backend and a standalone headless process, right? But it will be now connected not to IntelliJ, but to Visual Studio. So we will gain the same Visual Studio with ReSharper, but much, much faster. And the team is working on this, and we, um, I think next year we'll present something about it. What else to cover, which I'm allowed to cover. Taking a moment to talk about uh, converting the back end of Rider to .NET Core on non-Windows machines. Is that a significant gain for Linux and Mac users, or is it something that will just sort of happen and they won't really notice? Is it a massive change for users? Well, I cannot say users just struggling a lot and they're just screwed on Mac and Linux. They're quite happy there. Yes, there are some performance issues, mostly about the RAM consumption, because Mono is very, very greedy in terms of RAM consumption. And I believe so, because we have our own playback framework, which is quite exciting. If you're interested, I can say more about an infrastructure, how we built Rider internally. But this playback framework as a part of this infrastructure allows to easily monitor the benchmarks in different scenarios quite micro benchmarks, I would say, not just like 50 seconds for cold stop for some giant solution, but rather like 200 milliseconds to calculate completion in this specific scenario. And there are like hundreds of these benchmarks. So by comparing these benchmarks, we'll see the difference. And this is in the works right now. I cannot say any more. Sure. Yeah, we'll see the difference, and I really hope that .NET Core will be faster. The other thing regarding .NET Core is diagnostic tools. 
diagnose and troubleshoot.NET Core is seems to be much easier than Mono. This is another factor here why we are moving to .NET Core. I promise if we'll notice that .NET Core, for some reason, <laughs> surprising, will be slower than Mono, we'll still using Mono, of course, because the performance is the key here. We're not porting something to something just for to say, oh, you see, we are now in .NET Core. No, we're solving the specific problems here. I hope we'll do, we'll solve this. You can then presumably feed back to the .NET Core team. If something isn't as efficient as it could be, you could then, I suppose, using your playback tools, go, ah, right, okay, this particular thing in this particular setup is not as efficient as it could be. And then I guess you could, if you wanted to, I'm not saying you're going to, but you could, if you wanted to, provide some of that data and say, here's some more benchmarks for you to run the .NET Core suite against, I guess. Yes, exactly. And we'll surely do this and we'll surely collaborate with the .NET Core folks. They're all awesome, amazing people. We hung out together on Build and still we are collaborating a lot. All the technical guys from, from .NET Core team, they're just amazing guys and they're willing to help us. As it worked out with Mono team and our PRs to Mono and our bugs and issues and performance issues to Mono, I think it should work the same with the .NET Core team. I really hope. Just briefly touching on ReSharper being able to communicate with Visual Studio perhaps in the next version in the same way that it connects with Rider in that sort of server client idea. As a joke, does this mean that you could potentially have ReSharper as a service? Oh, you mean for all kind of uh, front end, and now you can? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, like, if I invent a front end and I say, "Ah, oh, right," I'll team up with the JetBrains team and license something, and say, "Right," I'll talk to Resharper via this communication method that they've come up with, and then I can add Resharper into my product. I guess. Well, interesting, interesting stuff. <laughs> 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 you know, which questions to ask? Definitely. Well, 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 well. The protocol which binds the backend and frontend is already open sourced. It's called RD. You can find it on JetBrains GitHub. I think it's JetBrains slash RD. And um, it is already open sourced. Now, the question is about licensing this closed ReSharper server. Well, there might be an opportunity to sell these servers with a separate license. Uh, I don't think we'll open source the ReSharp as a backend in the foreseeable future. But there might be an opportunity to like say, hey, there is a closed server. There is already implemented backend connection with this protocol. So all you have to do is just to implement the front-end part. And you can connect it anywhere you want. Maybe, I don't know, to... Notepad++ plus plus, <laughs> or to Chrome extension or whatever. Just implement the, the, the protocol and that's it. By the way, the protocol binds not just C-sharp and C-sharp. It binds Java, C++, JavaScript with the same on the other counterpart. So it's very quite cross-platform. You can choose. It might be, we'll see. First, we got to succeed with a resharper out of process. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite early to to say about such plans. Of course, yeah. And like I say, it was mainly said as a joke. So, you know, dear listeners, please do not hold the JetBrains team or anyone involved in ReSharper to what I said there. That was, you know, mostly used as a joke. But yeah, I, li- I like the idea that you went into the a little bit about how the protocol for ReSharper is out there in the open. So, you know, people can go away and read about how that works and Maybe there will be someone who connects it to their service. I don't know. Yeah, this protocol is a bit more complicated than uh, LSP protocol from Microsoft. But it's fine because with this, I hate the word complexity, it's not so complicated, not so complex. But it gives you lots of APIs to transfer much more and to control much more between two processes. And based on this protocol, we do not bind only riders front-end and back-end. We bind lots of things already in production. Riders with Unity Editor, as I told before, debugger host, remote debugger with a local rider, 
project model built, all of these are separate processes. Uh, WinForms Designer, WPF Previewer. So basically, when you launch Rider, you can notice that multiple processes will be will be launched under the hood. This is really a distributed IDE right now. <laughs> and all of these parts, they're connected with this protocol. So it's very, very much battle-tested, I can say. So would you say then that uh, Rider and pairing up with ReSharper and all of the different tools that it uses is kind of like a desktop microservice-based architecture? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say it like about the microservices because this word in some circles is, <laughs> you know. Sure, yeah. But yeah, yeah, you, there are different services which communicate with each other. And we have a front end and a back end, which are the major actors here. Okay, excellent. Okay. So just a few last questions, if that's all right. Uh, I don't want to take up your entire afternoon. So let's say that people want to learn a little bit more about uh, Rider, ReSharper, and all of the protocols and things. Is the best place to go to head over to jetbrains.com or whatever? Or is there a, a better place to go to learn all of these things? Well, there is certainly a better place to go. Ping me in Twitter, Case Krigan. You can find me on Twitter. Just search for JetBrains Rider, you'll find me. And we'll invite you to our separate Slack channel. This is a dedicated Slack channel for all kind of plugin writers, both for eSharp and Rider and Protocol. And we'll be happy to answer all these questions there. I think I really believe it works much smoothly there in the Slack not by instead of answering the emails it is a better place to answer this question there yeah so ping me and we'll send you the invitation so if listeners want to keep up with what you're doing is the best way to do that via twitter or is there like a is it github what's what's the way for them to find out more about you twitter is the best place i constantly monitor twitter and if you have any questions related to rider resharper I don't know, licensing, plugins, uh, SDK, API, any kind of question regarding Crider, feel free to contact me. Either I'll redirect it to, to um, a relevant person or I'll answer that directly. we am happy to answer that. Excellent. Okay. I'll get a bunch of links and put them in the show notes so uh, people aren't furiously writing down, so, you know, send a message to this person on Twitter to do this, do that. Rider is obviously a paid product, right? There's like a free 30 days trial. Yeah, we have a trial. Excellent. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. I didn't expect to go as technical as it did, but yeah, that's really opened my eyes as to just how much you work, you and the people on your team and the people on the Resharper team, and I guess the people at JetBrains themselves put into uh, their products. So thank you ever so much for, for being on the show. Yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you. And yeah, regarding maybe too much technical talk today, this is what happens when a technical guy becomes a manager. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. I always love hearing uh, talking technical with someone. Great. Awesome. Awesome. That was my interview with Kirill Skargan of JetBrains. Be sure to check out the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave me a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice and to come back next time for some more .net Core goodness. I'll see you again real soon. See you later, folks. The .NET Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited. 